Welcome, welcome listeners. Welcome to everyone joining us. Today I'm with my friends and fellow alumni of UC San Diego, Karush Koilu and Eric Silcock. Um, today we're going to be talking about education and Eric reached out to me a little while back. He's been working in the front line of education in California and Education is also something that Karush and I have talked about over the years, particularly uh, more with a view to the college end of education and how that functions, doesn't function, how it's exploitative, how it uh, prepares and doesn't prepare us for society as it is today and in a world that's really changing at a mile a minute. Um, And so with that, I want to throw it over to Eric and to Karush, if you just want to give a little introduction about why you're here, and then maybe Eric, you can kind of lead us into the conversation. Sure. I appreciate you having me, Jacob. Um, Happy to kind of get everything out at once because I have conversations with coworkers, conversations with my wife, and I have all these ideas and thoughts and they come and go, and I'm happy to kind of have a platform and and uh, two academic gentlemen to to talk through it with. So looking forward to it. Thank you. Everyone, I'm, I'm Karush Koilu. I have my own podcast. Thank you, Jacob, for having me on yours to speak with you and Eric today. Um, trained as an engineer, technical guy, but also um, really passionate about education, as Jacob alluded to earlier, and most of our conversations have been around uh, higher level education, but something that um, has, you know, taken a huge toll on the younger generations, and particularly within the United States education system, are the public school shootings. So um, something that we as Americans should definitely be aware of, regardless of our view on academics. Right on. Okay, I was thinking about um, kind of talking about the equity paradox, right? There's kind of culture wars happening in schools. Um, There's the idea of teachers as victims of exploitation, and there's kind of conversations about the extent to which the USA and that we prioritize education or even care about education. Um, So those are kind of my, my general topics. Um, yeah, okay. yeah, I think we got, got a lot to get into there then. Um, yeah. And also kind of holding that, that piece and, you know, it's a very deep and dark and ever present piece of the, of the school violence. Um, so may, maybe we can get into that a little bit later on, but also just the, the landscape of education is, is all over the place in so many ways. So right on. Yeah. Please carry on, Eric. Um, well, first, I was thinking that as a teacher, I've, I've, I've taught for seven years, and I, I have, you get like a, a pension that grows slowly. But overall, you know, we don't get paid enough, right? Um, there's a proposed law right now that's people are sending me links to about how teachers might get 50% raise over the next seven years. And, you know, that'll happen when I get my student loan forgiveness, right? Um, or or not, maybe we'll see. Um, but I think that there's too much bureaucracy and too much competing uh, prioritization of stakeholders. So a principal has to balance his students, his teachers, his community, his family, and his district expectations. And they're not all on the same team. Um, there shouldn't be a prioritization of, of, of stakeholders. Teachers should come first, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> But like, I don't know. So um, teachers as, as as victims, we you have an entire cohort of of uh, sorry, I have a note here. Entire population of people who are highly educated, all the social and financial associations that come with it, um, pretty much volunteering for a career with you know, little, little chance of financial freedom or, or, you know, excessive wealth. Um, and then you have an entire population of people who 
would roll their eyes at the teacher's complaints. You know, you chose this career, you have your pension, you have summers off is a funny thing that people say. You don't have summers off, by the way. Um, I fear that the financial strain of teaching is too intense. Um, and it's getting worse because in addition to the already known issue of financial stress is that the behavior is getting worse. Um, prior to COVID, I was saying things like, you know, these kids, you know, there's they're this and that, but overall there's, there's less bullying and kids are kind of more open to be themselves. I was saying that in like 2019, that's not true anymore. I'm, I'm hearing slurs, there's fights, there's, it's, it's worse than ever this year. Um, and it's getting worse and worse. And I think it's because we have this naive idea of like, here, here's my, here's my main thing. Sorry. I'm so, sorry. I'm so scattered, but my main thing is we're told if, you look at the discipline records and there's more students of color getting punished, you know, getting detentions, getting suspensions, and that's an equity issue. And you need to fix that. And so schools will fix that. They'll change that step. Now, did the school fix inequality in the country, right? Did the school undo the fact that certain populations weren't afforded homes in certain areas after World War II and weren't able to accrue equity, right? All these you know, top. It, 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 I think that teachers and schools are being tasked with creating equity, creating equality from the ground up, but it's not the case. Like, what job is going to interview you and say, "Oh, you have a an issue? Let me accommodate you." Like, of course, schools should accommodate kids, but I feel like we're we're we don't have enough resources, and it's just going to start to uh, avalanche, like snowball down. Where, okay, I I, I don't have enough, you know money to justify what I'm, I'm doing. So people are good teachers are going to leave. And then the kids behavior is super gnarly, but you can't punish them because it's not their fault. And, and so the teacher, like I'm dealing with a kid yelling, yelling, God knows what at another kid and saying what not to me. And, you know, I sent him to the office and he comes back with like, a, he gets a high five and comes back. And it's not, it's not just my admin doing that. It's, it's this naive idea that a school or a teacher can uh, fix the problem. It's like the education myth of, well, if we just taught them good enough, then they'd have a chance to get the job and then they'd be good. But we don't, maybe we could, maybe school could be that transforming ID, idea, but until everyone decides that they want that to be the case, until no one's benefiting from this continued exploitation, I, I, whatever it might be, I mean, you, until people want to spend more money on education, whether they have kids or not, I don't know what the problem is or what the solution is exactly, but that's my main, my main idea. So is like the snowballing effect of, of uh, us being tasked with like, Hey, like see, seeing the, the results of, of, for example, the behaviors as a, as the, the, the staff or the school having need to need to get fixed. When it's like, no, we're, anyways, I, I, I want to let you guys jump in a little. Sorry, I'm stream of consciousness too much. So you said you're not making enough to justify what you're doing. But when you say what you're doing, you just mean living in Southern California, correct? That's right. Yeah. Nothing and what like, like crazy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, owning a home at some point in my life would be neat, you know, <laughs> without having to move to a different, a uh, cheaper state. Yeah. And you also mentioned, you know, bureaucracy. There's an excess level of bureaucracy, and teachers are expected to come, you That's know, right. with this up, you know, bottom up approach, but really the delegation of how everything's done is top down, correct? Yeah. Big deal on that is we just finished our state testing two weeks with no teaching, but just testing. Right. And we have all kinds of ways to assess our kids, but we need to have a common one. Right. So that we can compare our kids to a different school or our state to a different state. Right. I get that. I get that. But I think the, the cost is too high. There's a whole you can read about testing and the politics of it. But I fear that there's people at the district office the ivory tower who need numbers to justify their job, their existence. Just pay the teachers. We'll do it. I'll tell you how your kid's doing. Right. <laughs> I don't know that, that that's the bureaucracy idea is 
it's largely that that's one of just the main examples about the bureaucracy thing is um, a lot of people who aren't in the classroom are like making decisions about my job instead yeah. of me <laughs> if i may um a couple of things just coming up i mean the first just around the economics of this it does sound like and this is kind of a trope already but like becoming a teacher being like a self-sacrificial act is kind of the vibe that I'm getting and what, you know, what's the consequences of making raising the next generation be a, a wholly self-sacrificial act in which everybody who does it is under some excess degree of strain. And, you know, like any time in life when you're just like working hard and you're not getting the compensation that's proportional with that, that allows you to feel good and well, it's just like, bears down on you and then that of course is going to drip down into the quality of attention that the kids are getting and then i'm hearing like there's kind of structural problems um economic problems behavioral problems that the equity diversity conversation is and i don't know i think we need to like pull this apart a little bit but more because I don't fully understand it, but it sounds like um, it's like unhelpfully distorting or manipulating the situation in a way that feels good or like dresses it up better, but doesn't actually um, exactly bring deep resolution. Yeah. Without anyone insidiously choosing to set it up this way, the people who are benefiting from a lack of equity are the ones who are advertising that they're being equitable. You're right. When you ask like the district office, when you see examples of inequality, asking teachers to fix it is like asking vegans to fix the problems related to over farming or asking uh, environmentalists to fix the problems related to, to fracking. No, I'm, I, I'm the one I'm the one already already. Wait, no, <laughs> I'm the one trying to close the gap. I'm the one victimized by the same the same inequality that we're all facing. Um, yeah, we're yeah we're funded by we're funded at the whim of people who have no idea what what it entails. And more importantly, like you said right there, I think that's the main thing is like, I think these these funding decisions are made by people who don't desire equity. They just desire to say it so because it looks good, so that they can feel good or whatever it might be. Um, our goals as educators might be in direct conflict with our government. That's the problem. Like we're we're funded by a country that doesn't prioritize education fundamentally culturally yeah i feel like the problem is like this metaphor is like <laughs> all these efforts i do in my class to like to like you know get to know the kids and then put their experiences into my work into the curriculum like and and try to try to get them to have conversations there's you know, millions of strategies i could cite i feel like what i'm doing is fixing like a band-aid wound right here on like a victim who's like bleeding out like the problem is just hemorrhaging right here but I, we're all working so hard to maybe fix this little cut when the problem mm. is just so blatantly obvious um yeah and and um um kids fall through the cracks they commit crimes they go to jail in my opinion that means that six months ago that kid's school failed to provide what he needed um kids need they're needy you can't just say bad parents and move on with your life. Like it's not your problem. Like criminals are everyone's problem. Um, I promise. And so um, when you have these behavior issues, it's like really tempting to blame the kid or really tempting to, it's just really, it's, it's really exhausting to look at the huge picture and try to figure out, you know, Oh, you know, anyways, but as long as you understand that no, no 12 year old wakes up and is like, I'm going to be bad today, you know? <laughs> <laughs> That, that's a very good point, Eric, is uh, it's not a simple solution. It's not like you're gonna do this, flip this one switch, maybe you flip three switches at school for this kid, and then this kid's entire life is gonna transform and he's gonna be, you know, he's not gonna be a criminal anymore. It's not that simple. There's a, there's a lot of factors that go into it, like, you know, exactly how a kid wakes up and goes about his day. Or her bed for, for you know. Yeah. 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 And we I don't know if if 
we should, you know, if, if my argument is like, oh, let's, let's fund education to the point where anyone who has any need is getting it fulfilled, like, right, there's, but when it comes to children um, who had nothing to do with their situation they're in, to what extent do we, do we feel obligated or compelled to, to provide for, for, for a kid who's not yours, right? Um, I also feel like one, one small egg, one small thing to, to include too is, I've thought about how it's a mostly woman dominated profession and I don't know, chicken or the egg, but that could have something to do with like the extent to which it's dismissed or, or looked down upon. Um, e easier to kind of uh, justify like, oh, you know, or, or maybe less, 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 less years on us when we do want to talk about the issues. Um, um, I have, Eric, yeah, Eric, when you say it's a woman dominated profession, is that grade school teaching or does that go up all through academia, like even through universities? I think that's just uh, K through 12. I think in universities, it's more evenly spread because in university, you know, there's more spe specialization. Um, in K through 12, it's, it's primarily women. Um, I wanted to say I had this, I have this note. I, I also had one more question to chime in yeah. um, before you continue, which is like, uh, you spoke to the sense of like conflict between what you as educators are doing and the people who fund you, the federal government. Um, mm -hmm. Like how, what's the kind of general breakdown of where the funding comes from and where, where is decision-making happening in terms of like federal versus state versus local yeah so there's lcff funding formula and it's basically it has to do with like the uh home values around your school is, is one and so as a school you can pick between like two methods of, of how you get funded and you're going to pick the one that's going to get you more funding and one of them is based on uh the the property tax of the homes around you and the other one is um subscribing strictly to LCFF and that's more of uh, how charter schools are funded and like performance based and you have to constantly do these like legislative you have to do these like these hoops to constantly like uh, advertise the effectiveness of your school in order to secure more funding so it's almost like a this like weird like merit-based approach to, to funding but that's that's more small that's more like charter school so it's largely like the value of the homes surrounding your school is going to determine largely the funding you get. And then of course, how many kids go there? Um, so there's not, you know, and, and that's, that, that's, that's all, that's all fine. It's, it's just that like, how is it the case then that all that while working at this school for my whole life, you know, not be able to have these homes. Right. Right. So if it's based on, if it's based on the home value, right. Then how, how is my salary 60 K seven years in. Right. Yeah. Um, so those funding F, those funding organizations are you know the local one that's uh or the property tax that's local correct yeah and then the one that you said is based on a few metrics similar to charter schools is that state or is that also more local like county or i think even school districts are smaller than counties yeah, that's, I think they're, it's all, it's all state funding. I think we get, yeah, I, I think our school would, or would receive very minimal federal funding, but I don't know the exact details about, about the funding. I've definitely like had a class on it and like learned about it at some point and like knew, knew what these acronyms meant, but it was more like, more just like hearing people talk about education and media and having a, you know, hearing about people who what was uh what was not to throw the word trump out but like what was the the woman he appointed as secretary of ed for a few years and she whenever i heard her talk you know she hadn't she hadn't been in the classroom and but then again so what's the what's the consequence if she's not making these, these huge decisions right but i think that because it's it's just the way it is and everyone deals with it, it no one's to blame but the but it's not enough 
Okay. When no one's in charge, that can, uh, like you said, lead to some issues. Yeah, and if and if if collectively, you know, if if I were to say, oh, um, you know, there's there's kids. I don't. Know, I, I guess it, until we, because it's a it's a state state funded, uh, because it's a collective. You know, it's it's our country's education. Until we decide that we want it to be better, it won't be right. I, I can't produce it myself by being a better teacher. That's like my main issue. Is I can't be asked to do a better job with my current resources. We everyone needs to kind of contribute. <laughs> yeah, how, but, how do you think? How do you think? You know. We're Californians. How do you think Californians can contribute to a teachers? Yeah, that's a good question. I guess it'd be um, how you vote. It might be, um, you know, uh, I guess that's that's a huge that that's that's what we're getting to is is we have this this all these stakeholders involved and and. I don't know. I'm feeling feeling a little like tongue tied. Hmm. I I think it's very, very reasonable to be tongue tied because the thing that you're tapping into is like much broader than like you're you're touching into the point where education touches everything else and right. everything else is in this state of huge flux and change. Some people would say crisis poly yeah. crisis meta crisis um and like deeper maybe deeper than how we vote and how we fund is like how we at like at the level of values where is where is education held what is the f why yeah, is this even important for human beings yeah education? that's that's it thank Life. you jacob thank you thank you that's thank you. That helped me a lot. Kind of kind of organize my thoughts. Um, yeah, philosophical question: To what extent is anyone accountable for for their actions or their situation? Right. We've we've decided that you are in, entirely accountable the day you turn eighteen or something, right? Legally, but we have also agreed like kids aren't. Well, if kids aren't responsible for their actions. You know, I mean, obviously, if a kid says something silly, I should punish that. But, you know, punish the action, not the kid, whatever. If if a child can't be blamed for his situation, then how are we letting this happen? How are we OK with the fact that there's been as many fights this year at my nice relative to other? Well, let's clarify that nice school. Right. Anyway, I have, I have a school. My school is there's been as many fights as weeks. Um, and the bathrooms are now closed. So kids have to go to the health office to use the restroom. And the, the health technician has to look at the restroom before and after they use it. Um, Cause they rashed, rashed the bathroom, peed all over it with a TikTok challenge, right? I feel like I, I tell my friends that they laugh and that's that, but it's like, these kids didn't come to school. Like as I, I think that we're, we're too quick to look at the kids and be like, punish those kids for doing that. Not like, what are those kids lacking that caused them to do that? And why aren't we uh, willing to, you know, to what extent are we really holding 12 year olds accountable for this shit? You know, you have to, you have to kind of, you have to kind of, but also, I mean, there's a reason why I didn't do that. There's a reason why I didn't do that in, in, in school, but I had some other dumb shit too. Right. Anyways. Yeah. Right. I mean, just well, briefly that like the massive psychological experiment that has been conducted on the generation of children that you are responsible for educating is like yeah. a huge factor in this ongoing and who's accountable for that is like silicon valley and you know in some respects and yeah and there's been really fucking deleterious consequences of that so that's that's really Eric, I still got you. Is Jacob off? Jacob froze on my end. Okay. I got we'll you keep, all right. We'll keep it going. 
Uh, to, kin to continue what he said, I actually uh, was having a conversation earlier this week with a parent um, of a 17 year old boy and it was a dad and this dad, you know, he was, he was particularly worried about school shootings. And he was talking about how every generation has like their trauma. He was saying his parents' drum generation had the trauma of uh, the nuclear, you know, the, the war with um, Russia, the Cold War. I forgot what his was, um, but when it came to our generation, he said that he thought the school shootings were, but, you know, for me, I thought something that really we might face is something that the generation under us might face is social media trauma. It's trauma from, like, it's kind of weird that this, like, that all these kids are, like, able to see all these other kids in the social network instantly you know, something might be posted. I, it's very strange dynamic and it's something that older generations didn't have to deal with. Great points. It's, I like the connection of like those old timey videos of like, now get under the desk when you hear the alarm. And it's like, how dystopian and scary is that for those kids? I'm doing the exact same thing. Close the blinds, go under your desk, cover my, cover my window and sit there with a weapon and tell the kids to shut up. Like it's very traumatic for them that, that that's this generation's trauma. And I like the idea of the next one having to do with social media. Um, my, I had an idea about social media and how just remarkable scrolling through TikTok or Instagram is and how just exciting and colorful it is. And how can I as a teacher be like, pay attention to me. We're gonna solve equations. You have to add seven to both sides. Next question, dude. I'm I'm watching Logan Paul get in a fight. Like that's way more fun, right? Um, but yeah, I think in a combination to the point of trauma and 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 an issue coming up with the next generation that we're seeing, um, COVID in combination with just how little interaction they had with how it was completely replaced with social media. I mean, I can't tell you how many of my kids still wear a mask, not for any COVID related reason, but so they can kind of cover their face and have their phone, have their device. And they've, they've been, they've been, that that's been acceptable for you. You know, that, that that's now allowed. And I don't think that social media led to people being more accepting uh, because they're being more exposed to other ideas. I think that social media has enabled echo chambers and, and, and feuds and, and, um, yeah, the cyberbullying is is going up again, and I don't know if it's how humans are wired, and we need to fight that by con by constantly interacting in person, or or what. But there's definitely consequences to them, um, you know, comparing their their personal life to other people's highlight reels and being um, allowed, enabled to always be on their device. You know, from the iPad kid to the Chromebook student. To the cell phone, you know, adults, right? Whatever. Are you allowed to say no, no electronics in class? Yeah, but we use we use electronics. We use every kid has a Chromebook, and we use that a lot. Wow. Okay. Is that yeah, kind we have of firewalled to restrict? No, it's really bad. It's really bad. There are programs that can do it. They're expensive. So there's an equity issue right there. There's an example of us not prioritizing education because um, not every school has the Go Guardian is the name of the program uh, where teachers can see your screens. So yeah, I got kids on cool math games all the time and on Discord sending pictures of each other and whatnot. That, you know, it kind of goes back to your point because um, that... For, you know, as I'm a software engineer, I'm a network engineer, and I know kind of how these things work. It's not very, if, like, even if you're just like, you'd have to put like a, oh, a signal blocker across the entire school for these kids to actually not be able to get onto like whatever they wanted to. You'd actually have to have some sort of thing on the school that completely blocked every signal that they could come in. 
And so until every school has that, these kids, realistically, everything they get is going to be kind of delegated from their parents. Like, did their parents put parental control on there? Did their parents, you know, talk to the telecom providers, say, hey, if it starts going to these terrible websites, just, just say no. So it's, it's like you said, that's very expensive and going to that GoGuardian, I don't, you know, that too, but like, even if like somehow all the devices that you know this or this, you, you think this kid is supposed to have and they're not supposed to have anymore, if you're able to control those, that kid could still have another device and then that device could still be connected out. Yeah, yeah, they're going to find a way. Yeah, I'm, I, I just, your last few comments, Eric, really kind of blew me away and I feel like the magnitude of the issue is, has grown substantially for me just hearing about this. Uh, Cause you know, I was probably in, I was in the seventh grade when they first brought in laptops and then they didn't have them in secondary school. And I I'm 27 now. So, you know, it's 15 years have passed basically. And just the fact that they have discord in the classroom to me is like that alone is like devastating to um the possibility of any kind of real concentrated engagement and yeah. it, you know the thought that was coming to me spontaneously was just like actually it sounds like this technology and its effect is going to demolish education as we know it i'll be pulled in too many different directions with too many different parent preferences and too many uh competing like entertainment it's like it's, it'll be hard for me to i mean during covid we, we tried that we, we we tried how much can you teach if kids have full access so we're on zoom like this every kid is a black screen doing playing xbox you know right if you have the opportunity to be on snapchat instead of listening to your math teacher come on yes yeah, yeah. sorry I, I did cut out that but um I guess what I was getting to is like the the possibility of sitting in like rows, everybody attending to the teacher and doing math problems. Um, like, it seems like what's obviously there's going to have to be some radical firewalls and regulations and a whole lot more uh, attention to the kids. What's fucking up the kids in you know from society at large, but it seems like the nature of education itself will have to um, evolve into something that's much more um, tactile and engaging. And maybe it, you know, looks quite different from education as we've known it of like 30 kids in a room, we're going to do English, then we're going to do math, and then we're going to do science, and it's all going to be preparing you to take SATs, and then that's going to get you to college, and ultimately it's a railroad to a job, but then it's not totally clear what the purpose of the jobs are, or whether the jobs even are going to exist in the future, and so do you see what I'm getting to here? It's like, what percent of what you learned in grade school do you use in your job today? Yeah. 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 I, I wonder all the time when I'm like beating my head against a wall, putting a circle into a square, wondering why it's not working, going, come on, get your stuff out. Come on. Where's your homework? And, I, and I'll, I'll stop and think, is this really what this kid should even be doing right now? <laughs> like, like it, it, can I really justify, like he, sh he needs to learn surface area. He must like, <laughs> is that, is that really what this 12 year old need, needs right now? Or does this 12 year old need something else? Yeah. That's such yeah. an interesting point. I mean, is that kind of, uh, is part of the answer to that, like the actual emotional, psychological character development, like all the stuff that's being completely, uh, you know, undermined by the new social media landscape, like those things, those actual socialization, if, if, if anything, that's what I'd say I took away from, from school is like, play friends that you know and a legislation to your point is that it's very hard to expel kids now and we do not hold back so you stay with your peers because being with your peers is more important than whatever you did or didn't learn in math class 
So kids are, but then you look at the high school teachers who are teaching algebra two to kids who haven't passed algebra one yet. But at the same table as a kid who's Stanford bound. And it's like, okay, how do I teach this, right? Um, but that, that, that came about because of what you said. Yeah, the social cohesion, the fact that we understood that like that's the most important part of school. That's what we're providing is kids to interact with each other and whatnot. I was thinking something that'd be kind of cool. I think Karush might enjoy talking about would be like, what is that solution? And I think the solution, here it is. Um, what about like an AI school that is tailored entirely to the individual and that you go at your own progress? So wow. you, you, you put the Oculus on and it's like, welcome, Eric. Today, you're going to, based on, based on a million pieces of data points I have on you, we're going to learn math, but you're going to be physically picking things up as far as you know, like you, maybe it's VR, or maybe you go outside and do it and you're interacting with things and there's incredible content in, in this store, in this device, right? Um, and that way, maybe you're at school and you take the device off and you look over at your friend and you're like, oh, your school looks so fun today. I, I have to work. I'm working really hard today, but then I get to do this. Like, you know, oh, your school looks so cool today. Like, you know, that's, that's, that's the perfect utopia idea is there wouldn't be this massive variety in class or there only would be in so much as it's beneficial to kids to understand that there's different people and they get to interact with them and learn how to communicate with them. But their learning is still entirely tailored to them and, and their abilities. <laughs> Completely tailored education, yeah. but not extremely expensive tailored education. Yep. Yeah. Because how we have it right now is it's it's pretty expensive. Education's expensive, but um, we have. I'm providing what what I described, right? I, I'm I'm it only so well, right? Not as well as we could possibly imagine, right? But I'm that's I, that's what we're tasked with is to understand all the kids in the room and to get them all to where they need to be, which is not equality. I don't give each kid the same thing. I pursue equity, so I give different kids different things based on their needs. But wow. that's just, could, yeah. Could you explain, you know, equality versus equity? Yeah, equality is like a like a fun word. It's like a happy word because of like our constitution or whatever. But it, it's just like it's kind of meaningless, um, and it doesn't actually make sense when you have un not unequal people based on their merit as human beings and the rights that they're entitled to, but unequal in the experiences they've accumulated. I have, I mean, you can't ignore the fact that you have a kid who both his parents are, are engineers and, or the mom retired and works from home now, or, or stays home and, and just takes care of the kid and, and tutors him and read to him and privilege and all and, and awesomeness sitting next to a kid who, you know, both parents are working full time and um, he's taking care of his sister when he gets home. And um, as a math teacher, I'm supposed to be aware of that and not just assign them the same page of homework and then give the kid who didn't do it a fail grade. I'm supposed to be really creative about it. So every assignment is available online. There's no more due dates. Anyone can turn in anything whenever they want. If I'm making parent calls, I'm making calls to those parents, not, not those parents. Um, and I'm you know, providing time before school where, where we're setting up lunchtime tutoring and we're not just opening doors, but we're supposed to just be like, Equity is not just opening the door, but actually grabbing the kids who aren't coming and pushing them through it. Um, yeah, I just feel like if that's kind of another thing is like, if we culturally, you know, if everybody understood, there's good and bad teachers, unfortunately. And, but if everyone understood just the significance of the task of the good teacher, they might be willing to give more resources to it. <laughs> Just, just, just the extent to which we are like producing equity from the ground up in an inequitable world. Just the extent to which we are, we have all this and we're keeping these here and we're pulling these up, right? Closing the gap. So how, what, what's a piece of equity for a kid who um, both his parents work full time. Maybe he only has one parent, and that parent works full time, and then also has a little sibling that, and that sibling would, you know, is dependent on the kid. You know, what, then, what's the, 
Okay. Equity, equity for that. That's a tough one. Um, but I can answer your question in general. Like if I have a, uh, if I have that kid, maybe that might correspond with like a language issue. And I would give him a chance to describe a math concept to me. And then he'd get a good grade on that assessment instead of filling out a multiple choice test that he was absent for or wasn't able to study for. Um, I, I, I would have a conversation with him, have more of an informal assessment to give him a chance to express what he knows. Um, yeah, stuff like that. I mean, uh, you know, little things like not planning events during Ramadan, you know, just being aware of all the differences of, of the, your population. That's really interesting. Going, you know, I want to bring one thing back and then I'll give it up to Jacob. Um, I recently, you know, I think it was actually just yesterday, saw uh, Tim Ferriss. I don't know if you know who he is, kind of like an optimization guru. And he spoke about IBM sales. They had a sales force back when IBM was a huge company, the top company in the world. And they would set their sales bars very low. And every year their salespeople would just destroy the sales bar. And it's, uh, it's not about, you know, and the point was you have to feel like you're winning before you can start winning. And I think that goes to your point, Eric. Yeah, an entire population that doesn't get to feel that and is constantly told otherwise. Yeah, and you know, ignored and any other assets that they're bringing to the classroom. Like the fact that they can take care of their kid, their, their sister when they get home, or the fact that they speak two languages. No, those don't matter. You need to do your math homework. Come on. Mm. Yeah, school isn't, it, sorry. School isn't like a, a, a certain way that everyone has to conform to anymore. School is just bending over backwards to, to the kids now. Mm. That's what I'm, I'm appreciating and and what you've said, Eric, is just the how fundamental the tailoring is to what the role of the teacher is to be. And it's a very human, human to human thing. And I, I, I have a lot of uh, caution and concern about how AI solutionism or technology based solutionism would disregard the importance of that, um, especially when AI as it currently exists is in a market, uh, attentional market capture context with very little deep, deep ethical orientation. And that's already what's happening to the kids is that being subject to uh, completely ruthless algorithmic, uh, you know, machinery uh, training mental illness to, uh, to a significant degree. Um, so, you know, whatever integration of AI occurs in education, I, I still think it has to be very like closely wedded to the reality of the human to human connection and tailoring. And I think that's, that's not just like um, good because it's, you know, because it works or whatever. Like, I think that's maybe like fundamental to homo sapiens, like how we learn is through play, through participation with elders, through other human beings. Um, and so even in the equity part, like, you know, I was kind of letting go of the equality equity distinction and just being with like, okay, what I'm hearing is you're not functioning as a bureaucratic box ticker. You're looking at, you're trying to be kind of holistic in what you're yeah. listening for, what you're seeing, and then how you're applying and creating the space of learning. Um, and so that's it, that strikes me as very pragmatic and uh and tailored and a lot of the kind of negative side of equity uh, um equity agendas is the opposite of that it's when it's not pragmatic it's not tailored and it's like um so so focused on getting the outcome at any cost that it you know becomes detached from the reality of what's possible or something like that yeah very well said yeah. Yeah. There's, yeah. Even, even considering AI to, pr to promote procedural fluency, to enable us to have more time for human activities, even that seems like, uh, is procedural fluency, like, you know, your math facts, isn't that still a human interaction? Isn't that learned by play? Isn't that learned by, yeah, absolutely. To what extent can you really learn 
Yeah, yeah. Because we have IXL, we have this program where you just do math questions online all the time and they hate it. And I'm like, watch the videos, like there's tutorials on there. But you know, that's a college level skill to like not know a math concept and to watch the video on YouTube about it and then to then to start doing it. <laughs> you know. Um, yeah, yeah, well, well said, well said. It's like, it's like, yeah. One, one thing I was thinking about, um, like the, the tool could have, and it goes to, you know, I was thinking this while you were speaking, Eric, and then, you know, it goes to your point, Jacob, uh, you know, some sort of tool that, it doesn't, I mean, the reason I think it needs to be AI is just because there's not enough funding within teaching education more generally. And kind of that's the point you were driving home earlier, Eric. Um, but one thing is that kid who's Stanford bound is going to have to one day collaborate with that, you know, kid who's struggling really, really hard. That's just a real world thing. And so having those, that tool, you know, integrate those, those interactions somehow where, cause like, if you don't have that, that, that Stanford kid could go through his entire three years of middle school, four years of high school, and, you know, just kind of know about that other kid. They're just like acquaintances at school, never really talked, maybe said a few things, but like, they're not really ever collaborating. They're not ever like getting down into like a thing that says like, hey, we have to use our skills. You know, we have to figure out who's got the strengths, who's got the weakness and, you know, do this task accordingly um, with that. Because, you know, in something that Stanford kid, you know, in the traditional sense has some great skills, but like you said, there are these other skills that this, you know, other person, maybe, Maybe this task is written in, you know, maybe this person has a mother who, you know, we live in Southern California, so this is a very normal case, only speaks Spanish. The mother does not speak English. And so that kid is pretty fluent in being able to translate things between Spanish and English. The other kid, you know, maybe two parents are engineers, pretty good, you know, with some engineering things. Maybe it's some sort of task the AI sets up that's like some instructions in Spanish and about something. And then, the, you know, that's just an example of something. But like the reason that this can't be done now is because it's very expensive. I mean, a teacher can try and do that, but like that sort of tailoring is expensive. Mm -hmm. It's easier to create some kind of rubric and see how those kids measure up and evaluate them based on that and move on. And that's, there's, there's merit to that too. Yeah. One yeah. thing uh, that's coming for me, um, and I know we're kind of getting to the last 20 minutes or so, but um, my sister uh, lives in San Diego. She's got three kids. She decided, she, they did a little bit of uh, pre-K and elementary, but she's homeschooling them all now. And she's like many, many Americans, um, part of a whole like homeschooling network. And in terms of tailoring, I mean, there's a lot of issues with homeschooling and, you know, especially at the end of like lower socioeconomic conditions, it, you know, is where the, where the state schooling is very important. But in terms of tailoring, in terms of like experimentation, it does seem like that is a, a um, that's kind of a laboratory space outside of the mainstream education structure where people, people are able to do a lot more things and just try stuff out. Um, and maybe, uh, you know, that's a, that's a place where the new approaches to education can be forged a little bit. And, but then there's a question of like, how does that stuff feed back in is, you know, is is it even working? Does there have to be some sort of um, education revolution uh, in terms of this whole structural pipeline of education and the kinds of human beings that it's producing and whether that's even useful? 
and whether we want to put more generations of children into that at all you know do you know we have it yeah. we inherited it it's already there we need to do the best we can with it but yeah. is it well, even let's just get the right kind everyone of you know all 370 million of us to agree on what what school should be let's all let's have every single person agree <laughs> on exactly what we want the outcome to be yeah and then until that happens right then but i really like the idea of looking at alternative education happenings like homeschool as like a sandbox as a reference as a what are things happening there that are that, that are awesome um yeah i feel like we're we're our fundamental function in, in the especially particularly in the low socioeconomic area is a chance to um like child care right a place for the the human children to be while the parents are working and you know we're, we're, we're providing that fundamentally outright that's the bare minimum <laughs> to what extent do we collectively think that it can be more and yeah how to get there yeah i appreciate you guys i know i've been like so rambly and so like there 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 and i'm just really appreciative and really impressed at your ability to kind of synthesize and reiterate and and to to share uh so thank you for that thank you for providing some structure <laughs> really really impressive well it's been it's been wonderful and uh it you know just speaks to how much of a multi-dimensional uh field education is when we actually unpack it and how it connects with everything else uh, so we really have to be able to hold a, hold a conversation like this. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm really glad. And I also feel like, you know, there's just like, no, oh, he, he froze while exploding. <laughs> I know. Uh, that's unfortunate. That's really unfortunate. Uh, well, we'll keep it rolling until he comes back and then he can, you know, continue. Uh, Jacob, you're back. My apologies, gentlemen. Um, I am back. Yeah, just just to reiterate how much of a like we've we've covered a little bit, but there's so much more to get into around education. Um, and yeah, I don't know if there's any more uh, really outstanding pieces for either of you, or if you want to draw things to a close here. I'm I'm quite open. Yeah. Um... have you heard you've heard people say well we need trash pickup well we need you know we need you know low level laborers oh we, we we need those people in those jobs right that kind of like almost bigoted approach to like well some kids are going to fail we need we need mcdonald's workers like that sentence right i think that at least in the, in recent years a, 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 a positive thing about culture is that it seems like there's very few people still making that argument um, at least in younger, younger populations. Um, it seems like we we're, we're at least agreeing that school can be a, um, a place where every single kid can become, uh, like independent and satisfied with their life. So any, any job that any career that they might end up in can at least enable them to feel some base level of objective freedom. And, you know, I don't mean to steal the end of it, but teaching should not be one of those. Teaching should not be art. Sorry, when I say that, it, you know, students shouldn't you know, have this mindset going in. I don't know about the UK, Jacob, but in the US, it's very pronounced. Um, you know, people, Young people shouldn't like be worried about becoming a teacher because they don't want to be financially stable. That's a that's a thing that for the rest of us Americans, really, um, it, it it costs us. It costs you know our children of the future, and you know, if we don't have children yet, but we all I I do want one. I do want some, and so um, we don't want the teachers that teach them to be struggling, and we you know we want good qualified young people to aspire to be teachers. So going to your point, 
it's really important for just for us to keep in mind that we want the kids to have that idea, but also, you know, teaching that that one curriculum, the, the ones that are inspiring the students, we have to really uh, care about their well-being. Yeah, yeah. And that's this. Thank you. There's such a such a strong connection between this isn't just like I should get paid more. It's if I was paid more or it, well, that's one aspect of it. But as yeah, culturally, if if it was a good job to have, if if in the USA, it was a good job to have, then there'd be better people doing it. And, and th there'd be there'd be it'd be it'd be occurring better. Yeah. Yeah. No, really, really excellent uh, point there, Karush, and feels like a good kind of closing note. And I, I certainly just reflect on my own educational experience of very particular teachers that helped me along at certain moments and kind of injected some aspiration that I didn't necessarily have coming from a more working class background and coming from a family where all my siblings didn't have super high academic uh, orientations, it was those handful of teachers at those moments that led me to, to you know, go to university and then from there um, have the have the life that I've led. So those, it feels like, you know, people who reach out a hand and take you from one part of the journey to the next. And that's really, really important. And uh, I, I also think it's really important that we think about how to have that continuing beyond the mainstream educational structures throughout adult life, um, through mentorship and, and things like that. And, and, you know, really build a continuity of this as well. Yeah. We shouldn't, we shouldn't see helping the next generation as like lesser or even feminine or even inferior. We should see helping the next generation as like our absolute number one priority <laughs> and that. And like, I don't know, there's a lot, a lot there, but I, heck yeah. Thank you both so much. Yeah, yeah, thank you so much, Eric. And thank you, Karush. It's been a pleasure. Sorry about the little interruptions, but it's been a really, really wonderful conversation. So thank you both. You got to let us know when you're in California. <laughs> I will do.